just sold my old traditions Hawkins to a friend of mine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he really wanted to get into it. And I was like, and then like, get this last night he called me. He was like, Hey, so this gun won't go off. It's like, did you snap caps? No. Oh shit. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I'm going to walk you through how to just dis- take apart the, the, um, the nipple and pour powder in. He's like, I don't, I don't like the idea of this. This is exactly what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes it. It's but like, that's how you get the ball out. It's, it's like, well, can't we just shoot it out? Yes, we can, but I don't feel like using a CO2 cartridge tonight. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to use up one. Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're talking to my good friend, Eddie Davenport from the North South Skirmish Association. Eddie is their current editor in chief, I think. If that's not his title, that's the one we're giving him uh, for the <laughs> for the skirmish line, the the NSSA's uh, great magazine that they put out. But uh, Eddie has a great background in in black powder shooting sports, and uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, his hunting experiences here before the show. So I'm excited to have him on. And uh, Eddie, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on, Ethan. It's a uh... A pleasure to be back on this side again. Last time we spoke, you were still um, doing the other podcast, so it's great to be here. Yeah, yeah, we can stretch our legs a little bit here, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, don't have, um, I guess I still have to be professional on my side, unless oh, I go yeah, off the record. Right? Yeah, we can make this like uh, Eddie after dark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, light up your cigarettes and let's go. <laughs> no, but thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's it's great to be back in the swing of things. Like I said, we just. Um, we finally had a nationals again, which I th- it's been about um, two years almost, basically, it, it, basically just because the way our nationals fall in that mm-hmm. we finally had one. So it was great to get out and see everyone again. Like we were having the smaller skirmishes, but we hadn't really had a chance to do the main one. And so that was a couple of weeks ago and just got and got back from that. And it was awesome to be finally back on the line and kind of forgotten how much I love that aspect of the competition and everything. Yeah. So the NSSA, they just had their big national match, which is what you're talking about. And yeah. how many shooters are there? And could you give us a brief overview of some of the events and things that you guys do there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so... <laughs> So um, as far as like number of com- com- competitors and stuff, it's it varies. But I mean, I think roughly we like on Sunday morning, like because we now do a one single phase shoot. I mean, we have teams going from position one, I think, out to around position 60, I believe now. OK. And so there's eight man teams each and there's three relays. And so each position is filled up three times. And so there's that kind of gives you a rough estimate how many people are shooting. Mm hmm. And um, so if you don't know what we are um, and you're able to just go on YouTube and like search up the NSSA recruiting video that does a really cool like overview of us, but I can kind of give you the dime special right now. So we are a Civil War based shooting organization, hence the North South Skirmish Association. But um, we shoot um, we shoot musket matches, which is the big one. We shoot carbines, uh, repeating rifles, which most people use um, repo Henry's, but you can also use other repeating styles. We have pistol matches. We do. We also have artillery matches. So we do mortar and cannon, um, which are by far some of the coolest events that I think exist on the planet. Because yeah. very, very few places allow you to do actual artillery matches. Um, and this year, actually, we did a um, a new well. So we have one more event. We have a smooth bore event that they do as well. Like a lot of guys actually use original smooth bores from the early 1800s. But this year we introduced a new form of competition. Um, it was our demo match. And from all, from everything I've heard, it went really great. And I'm thinking it's, they're going to try to fit another match into this really packed week. Fantastic. But it's, um, it's the single shot pistol competition. And um, they even did a team version of it. So, like, you know, you shoot one shot and you have to speed load your pistol and, sh- and just competing against the clock and breaking targets. And, man, it's uh, it, they did it, unfortunately, before I was able to get off work and get out there. But oh. I saw the pictures and it sounded great. That sounds awesome. You guys shoot a ton of... Uh, it's a lot more timed and like reactive and you have the team set up. It's a very engaging way. I think a lot of people wouldn't be used to when it comes to black powder competition. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, like let's, let's talk about like the big, one of the bigger ones in the, um, that we have in the United States is the NM, NMLRA matches. Mm-hmm. And then of course you have the international side where they all, what is it? Um, in Germany and Switzerland where they do like, again, paper targets and style. Yep. 
and stuff. And we do that here. I mean, we we still have the individual team, or excuse me, the individual paper targets and stuff that people shoot at. But what kind of separates us from everyone else in every other shooting competition out there is we have the the team stuff. And what it is is that we'll, we'll just talk about musket and musket and carbine, and we'll guess Henry as well. But or repeat, I should say. But the musket is the big one that a lot of people come out to watch and everything. But on that, it's an eight-man team. Uh, you're shooting at 50 and 100 yards, and each each round you have five minutes. Um, you have a five-minute timer, and you have hanging targets like you have uh, 32 pigeons on a cardboard backer at 50 yards. You had um, you have 16 hanging tiles, um, which are four by four tiles at 50 yards. You have 16 hanging pigeons, um, 16 pot silhouettes, which are the uh, for being quite honest, the, um, the the worst target I've ever met in my entire life. Not because, <laughs> and I'm sorry, guys. Everyone in the NSSA knows it, but they. So you guys, can you imagine? Um, you know, back in the day, they had like the clay pots that people would actually the terracotta plant. Like, yeah, yeah. You would smart, put a small starter one in. Yeah. Well, because those are hard to get, and like um, buying those um, does like take yeah, up a lot of money. Up, yeah. And they were and back in the day, they were the worst design because you could hit on one side. The target would flip around. You couldn't tell it was hot, it hit. Oh. So you'd have to shoot it again. So it is a pot. So it is a flat plaster based target that looks like a pot at 50 yards. OK. And so and it's I mean, if you can hit it, they break good. It's just they're a small target. <laughs> and then you have. um I think I hit everything on 50 yards, uh, but then on 100 yards, it's it's usually tiles. So again, they're 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 bigger tiles. They're six by six tiles, and like I said, you're the team base. You're shooting against the clock, and the idea is you shoot break all your targets first to win. And you mean you think your muzzle, your shoulder to shoulder of uh, men and women, every gun's going off at the same time. So you can imagine how much smoke's in the air. And like <laughs> this past nationals, especially on um, Saturday when we did the carbine competition, which is my, my baby. I love the carbine. I, hmm. I have more national championships with that than I have with anything. But when that was going off, especially because you can shoot faster with the carbine, man, between the smoke and the fog, it was almost impossible to see. Hmm. That's incredible. I'm going to have to make it out to one of those, one of your national matches here at some point, just to experience it. Like, like I told you last time, man, you're a, uh, you're my guest list. You anytime you want to come out, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, what was it like to be back after a couple of years? Was everybody, you know, kind of just back to normal, or was it, did it take a little bit to get used to to being back on the range and and back in the same place as everybody? So, um, unfortunately, on um, there was a lot of fouled firearms. Um, I guess where people just, you know. Um, hadn't really touched their gun in a couple of years just because mm. they haven't had a reason to. And so we had a lot of filed firearms, but I mean, as far as safety wise goes, there was no major accidents. Good. It was, it was, um, this is where we reached the sad part of the stream. Sorry guys, but there was a little depressing hearing our taps call out Oh yeah. when we finally did it. Cause that probably took like five minutes to lead all the names of the members that we had lost during COVID and not just from COVID, but just like in general, just from age and stuff like that. So yeah. we unfortunately lost a lot of members, but it was great to see the ones that are still around. And I mean, a lot of, uh, like now, like my team, um, I'm about, I'm eight hours away from my actual team now. Cause where I live now in the Western part of Carolina and my team is based out of ports of Virginia. So yeah, I think like mountains of North Carolina to the coast of Virginia. Wow. And so I don't, I haven't really got to see my team in a long time. So it was great to see ac my actual team that I know and like they were my family mm -hmm. and then just my, the, my extended family of the other teams. Cause there's some people that I only see at nationals or I only see at the big national events, like some of the guys from Wisconsin and Texas and New York and stuff like that. Just, I mean, it's one thing to shoot, see them on Facebook or shooting emails and other things to walk up, shake their hand, say how you're doing and stuff like that. Mm, that's great. I'm really glad that you guys got to, get out and have that i mean it's uh it's been a weird year i think for for black powder but i'm really glad that the big events are are able to get back and, and get yeah. going and i think everybody's been kind of sitting around there's been a bunch of new people getting muzzleloaders mm -hmm. and they finally had a chance now to kind of join the rest of us out and yeah. uh, enjoying the matches and from what i understand talking to some people that do the recruiting we actually grew a little bit during the the shutdown which is kind of 
strange to think that there's people joining an organization you can't shoot for a bit. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think, but yeah, uh, we grew during that. It just <laughs> – so happens GoX made their announcement the day one of the national. So you can imagine the panic by that set in. Oh no. Yeah. Can we talk about that some? <laughs> sure, <by all> <laughs> I think that's kind of like the, the elephant in the room. Right yeah, let's just jump right in. We're like a few minutes in here. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What was that like for you guys? So, so like, um, just like you, you got the email. I got the email straight from GoX for like the, you know, the media style stuff with my work. I got the email from them and I immediately shot back an email and I got a response that day going um, like what their hopes and stuff for, which at this point everyone knows they're hoping to sell to another people, a brand that'll keep them open. But there is one, the, the people where you can buy powder up there is Back Creek um, Supplies, mm -hmm. which is just, it's a little place right outside the range because we don't allow the powder to be sold on the range. Just for safety purposes, we don't want people keeping a couple kegs of powder in their um, the trailer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I went up there just kind of like everyone else did to buy powder, and I went Saturday, and I'm really glad I did it. Uh, and I think it was announced on what a Tuesday, right? I think. I think it was a Monday. Okay, Monday. All right. But I so I got up there Saturday. Um, and Saturday was when, like, I guess the majority of people in the organization was able to finally get out and go get stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I bought some stuff then, was able to keep it off-site. But it took me an hour and a half to get through the line. And we got up there. Luckily, they did it smart. They limited you to five pounds of GoX. Yeah. And then from what I understand, that day, they limited you to five pounds of anything. Wow. But, I mean, it's from – they sold out of their entire supply, which, I mean, they have a bunker down there. I don't know – I don't want to – take a guess how many they have <laughs> how they have but i like if i had to take a guess it was probably a, like probably a couple hundred if not more kegs of powder they keep down there and they sold out of everything wow so i mean great business day for them but it's just sad to think that like we sold that much powder and then for the time being um well i know like the great people at swiss are gonna you know step up the game and everything and get some stuff going it but it's gonna there's gonna vo there's a void that needs to be filled yeah yeah for sure I, uh, yeah, it's just been kind of a, that first week there was just kind of crazy, um, with that new, I think, I think people are kind of calmed down now from what I've seen. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's not like the, it's not like the primer panic where everyone bought like, like 10 million primers. At yeah. One time, but... Yeah. And <laughs> I think the, the distributors I talked to that week, you know, I think by Wednesday they had restricted you to like a, a single pound a day. Because they didn't want people to people to run on powder, and I, I think uh -huh. that week the the NMRA also just they they closed down sales, um, just until they got a handle on on what was going uh -huh. on, and that seemed to be everybody I talked to, pretty much across the country, kind of limited. I, I know there's some small shops out west that I've been told that aren't really feeling affected by it. Um, there's not really people making a run or anything on it. But um, uh -huh. I know on some of the forums, I saw some folks claiming to have, have ordered 50 pounds, but I'm not, I think they were just kind of goofing. I don't know that there were 50 pounds at one, <laughs> at one distributor to, <laughs> to buy at once, you know? Yeah, we had 50 pounds of powder laying around. I mean, we had one store in my local area that, ser that sold powder. And I was the one that informed them that the GoX shut down. And the next day they hiked their prices up double. Yeah. I was like, I probably shouldn't have told them that. <laughs> you should have bought a couple before. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten to talk to Aaron at GoX a few times. I mean, mm -hmm. the man shoots straight. He's very friendly. He's very approachable. And if he says like, that's their plan, I trust, I take him the man at his word. He's never, he's never given me a reason not to believe him, you know? Yeah. I think that's really great, especially if you've if you've dealt with him, you know, over the years. I think this was probably one of a couple interactions I've ever had with him. Um, and I, I took him to be the same way. A lot of people, I think, were pretty set in what they thought before they went into um, kind of hearing what they had to say, mm -hmm. um, even in my interview, too, with him. Um, you know, which I understand there's a lot of, it's, it's frustrating to hear this, but I, I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm thinking positive on it. <laughs> I think yeah. right now I, I've got to be positive about it because I, I really don't want it to be negative. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just like everyone else. I'm scared. Like, like it's hard not to be, to think yeah. that like the, the powder supply, cause I mean, black powder this past year, well, during, well, during COVID, I think black powder just exploded in popularity. Mm -hmm. 
and like more states have picked it up. And I granted now granted a lot of that is modern inline stuff. Um, but I mean, Blackhorn Black, Blackhorn 209 is still hard to find, and people just if they panic buy black powder, they'll panic buy everything else too. Mm-hmm. That was the the thing that really surprised me about it is when I saw Hodgden buy Blackhorn 209, I thought, okay, wow. Um, I mean, I, I understand the the monopoly concerns and things, um, but I was I was again trying to be optimistic about it. And I thought, wow, these guys are really making a play here for continuing muzzle loading and, and black powder hunting and shooting. They've got the big brands in their pocket now. And Hodgdon's, you know, I think I said it in a video once, like Hodgdon is saying, like, look, we're here to support muzzle loading. Uh, the last thing I, I ever expected him to do was to to close GoX and to and yeah. to sell it here. That was the absolute last. I mean, that was just like a gut punch. I was like, whoa. I am glad that he confirmed it wasn't just because of the explosions that they're doing. They're doing it for a business decision. Like, if you look at it from their point of view, it makes sense. Yeah. And that, so, like, yeah. <laughs> that's the hard pill, I think, for a lot of us to swallow that are into old muzzleloaders, myself included. Like, I've got a couple inline videos and, and I, I post news about them and things, but my heart is really at, on the traditional side. Um, but for for these big companies, when they're looking at m- numbers and charts and graphs and meetings and whatever business guys look at, you know, they're they're seeing the massive growth potential that is there with muzzleloader hunting, and uh, that growth isn't necessarily with the traditional side of things. Now, my you know, and stop me if I'm rambling here, but um, <laughs> from what I see when it comes to inline stuff, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of muzzleloading enthusiasts and hunters that started with an inline and are now you know, two years, five years, maybe 10 years into muzzle loading, and they're going back in time and they're going mm-hmm. back to the percussion and they're going back to, you know, cap lock muzzle loader, or um, revolvers. And then they're going back to flint locks and they're going back, you know, to dog locks and sometimes even farther, you know, to get to that challenge that they first felt when they, they picked up a new, with their first muzzle loader, regardless mm-hmm. of it being an inline, you know, they still kind of traveled back in time. And I, I think that there's a lot of people out there that, do that over the course of their their time with muzzleloaders so as much of a a kick in the teeth as is i think it's still there's still potential there for us and i think it's good i mean i think that right there it speaks a lot to like um hunters in general like i mean a lot of us we enjoy the challenge it's Mm -hmm. like uh some of my best hunting trips i've ever had my entire life is days i never even pulled the trigger yeah. Our, our, our days where I, I pulled the trigger, I released the arrow and I did not come home with a deer. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the ones you remember. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it speaks to the challenge. And like for that, it's like, I can 100% agree. Like I, we were talking about ahead of it before him that I had a friend of mine that uh, he bow hunts religiously out here. And he actually just bought a uh, traditions cap lock off me just because as soon as he found out, I like <laughs> for muzzleloading season, I let him borrow um, a Richmond carbine, like an, um, a, a, um, to go out hunting with. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Oh my God, this is so much cooler than like shooting a scope. Cause he's like, I haven't shot open sights in 20 years. And I'm like, well, now you can shoot open sights with an original. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so like the day afterwards, it was just, it was, it, it like it stung. I mean, it's like, I got to get this. And it's like, I have an inline. I just like, I want to try something different. I'm like, here you go. <laughs> yeah. I think no matter, no matter what you hand somebody an old school muzzle loader and you let them shoot it, they're going to smile. Like they've never smiled. Like mm-hmm. or maybe like they smiled when they shot their very first gun. as like a kid, you know, as a lot of people start when they're kids. Well, um, you talk, but, you talk about going back in time. You, you finally put the bug in me and at nationals, I was, um, it was actually my wife's gun. We haven't shot it yet because we're trying, we're waiting to get, um, the actual flints in cause we couldn't find them, mm. but I sent you the picture, but yeah. I, but I, my, <laughs> it's my wife's gun. I can't claim it as mine, but we got a flint lock, um, pistol, a uh, single shot pistol. in, and so I found that's my actual, my first flint lock I've ever owned as many years as I've been doing this. Cause um, I know Ethan knows this, but if you don't guys, like I, I'm 34 and I was born into the organization. I, I, I was born literally during the first um, national, my uh, nationals. And I, and like I said, my first shoot was at two weeks old. So I said, when I say black powders in my veins, it's in it's my there. veins. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, that was like, and I'm just, man, we're itching to shoot this thing. Cause I got my, I got myself a little pistol target set up in the backyard and I was nice. like, I'm waiting to like let that thing fly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, it's been really nice here on the weekends, nice and cool. And I've been cleaning up my range and adding some things to it. I'm really excited to 
keep shooting, keep adding stuff to it. Not Trying to get the pistol like, range, unfortunately, but mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, uh, I can stretch out to a hundred yards and then if I back up, I can get out to two, which is about nice. all, about all I need. <laughs> That's kind of like when I grew up, when I was living at my parents' place growing up, we could, we technically had a, a 50 yard range, but I just had to stay in two feet off the highway. <laughs> <laughs> had to stand in the ditch. Yeah. Just shooting down and shooting down the sidewalk to tell everyone, all right, you cannot walk outside right now. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first at, uh, at Eddie's, <laughs> Eddie's home. Look, man, I, look, man, I, it, 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 you did what you had to do. Okay? Yep. You, when you got to shoot. You gotta shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the if we're talking about the Goic situation, I mean, I have hopes. The a brand that big and so and lucrative, someone's gonna buy it. Now yep. the pro uh, is just hopefully whoever buys it actually uses it to keep going and not just kind of like. I don't know how they could buy it and not keep it going, but I hope whoever does it knows what they're doing or is passionate enough to want to learn what they're doing. Yeah, I think because as 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 good as Hodgson was with it, I think you know, similar to some of the other companies we've been kind of talking about, there's a lot that can be done to reach more people. Uh-huh. And uh, like Swiss, for example, I was at a I was at a chunk match this weekend. And Swiss sponsored a case of powder for the for the match. And there were only like 40, 45 people at this match. But that kind of mm-hmm. grassroots involvement from Swiss and, Swiss and Schutzen is just fantastic. I mean, they, they know that their shooters need their supplies. And, I mean, you can, at that match, odds are you're going to win enough powder to make up for the powder that you shot for that match. It's only 10 shots. You know, wow. so you're, you're, <laughs> you're very easily walking away with a net gain on your supplies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Tammy from Swiss, she, she, like the day the Hodgin came out, she was, she on was Facebook on it. and social media just going, it's like, Hey, we're, we're aware of this. We're, we're, she's not saying what they're going to do, but they're going to take care of things. And like, mm-hmm. I was able to speak to her briefly. I mean, just through the NSSA stuff, just talking on that. I and mean, then we, we spoke about it and again, you know, not, not trying to put words in their mouth, but they said that they're going to, they're going to help, they're going to do something to fill the void. Yeah. Now, what does that mean in practice? We don't know yet, but then again, these things take time. They're, yeah, I think they're based out of Europe. And so it, even if they do take over, even if they do move into America, it's just going to take some time or if they buy GoX, like we don't know, but yeah. we know that the black powder is still going to be here. There's, if nothing else, it's, it's, it's way too popular in Europe, not to exit, not for something to make it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that the, the growth we've seen the last couple of years, that there's enough in the traditional side of things that, um, that somebody can step in and, and, you know, I love Swiss and shoots and powder. That's what I, my family shot in our match guns for years. As long as I've been alive, we've shot Swiss and shoots in, in the match, in the match guns. But I think that, in, in my I argument, always knew you were you were refined and oh, upscale. Yeah. I am. This is a high culture show here. Eddie. I don't know. I'm wearing my blazer. I've got a nice drink. I got some tea here. <laughs> and that's redneck hillbilly folks. We're shooting the Goak Two F. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been I've been planking with a lot of Goaks, but um, <laughs> I, I like my argument with the whole time has just been you know having it made here. As much as I love the imported powder, having it made here, I think, is really important. And I think I, I mentioned that in my first uh, article I published about it. Like, this would be the first time in American history that we weren't making powder here. And that just feels weird to say. Like, that could be a possibility. Mm-hmm. Like, this yeah. is the black powder. This is the powder, you know, arg- arguably not changed a whole lot from the powder that, you know, gave us independence. <laughs> and. Uh, for it to not be made here, I think is is really weird. So I, I'm I'm hoping that somebody steps in there and and does something yeah, I mean, with it. It's something about being American made. I mean, mm-hmm. like I I don't know where all your listeners are from, but I mean, but the it is a certain amount of pride to have that. Also, just the history aspect. I mean, we're not shooting these guns because we don't somewhat love history, even if it's just the history of guns. Yeah, we're not shooting them because they go fast. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the day after that news came out. Uh, I did a I did a muzzleloading demonstration. Somebody had asked me to come in and um, and show off a couple muzzleloaders. So I took my I took my flintlock Kibler that I built this year, and 
I was like, I almost kind of wondered like backing out, like I didn't know how many people were going to be there and how many people were want to, going to want to shoot. And I was like, man, if powder is going to be limited, I don't know how much I want to go burn, you know? But I, mm-hmm. I said, you know what, it, you know, showing some people muzzleloaders doesn't matter. It's going to be fun. And I was, I went there and I think like half a dozen people wanted to shoot, but the smile that each one of them had after they <laughs> shot that flintlock for the first time, some of them, it was the first gun they'd ever shot. And for everybody, it was the first muzzle that had ever shot, but all of those smiles made it very worth it. Like I was, I was bummed going into that thinking like, man, this is kind of, this is kind of like a swan song maybe for, for muzzle loading and black powder here. Um, but I left that like, okay. We, we cannot be down in the dumps about this. This is too important. This makes too many people smile just to give mm-hmm. up and lament, you know, something that's dying. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up yet. <laughs> I, uh, I volunteer as an assistant scout master for the Boy Scouts of America. And a couple of years ago, I got, I took on my old troop uh, that I was used to be involved in uh, at summer camp. I, I talked to the, the, the guys there in the shooting range I was friends with and, and I was like, hey, can I bring up muzzleloaders? And we do a night one night. And I was like, yeah. So like each of the kids, like there is adults and kids get to shoot muzzleloaders for the first time. And <sighs> and most of the stuff I brought up was originals. Mm-hmm. And so not only they're shooting a, like a muzzleloader, they're shooting originals off a of bench and everything. And each one of those kids was just beaming. And some of those kids, <laughs> it was the first time they ever fired a gun in their life. And nope, we're not starting off with 22. We're going to a 58 caliber, boys. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to the big one. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full-bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're talking about like actual powder concerns. It's, so you'll get a kick out of this as many years as I've been doing black, um, black powder um, and everything and all the championships and stuff. Uh, in order to do stuff with the Boy Scouts, you have to have the certs. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm taking the NRA black powder instructor course this weekend. Oh, man. And um, when I was applying for it and everything and taking it, the because I um, the guy wanted to know what my hit background stuff was of black powder. I was like, uh, just because I wanted to make sure that I could be a, a last minute good fit in the class I was like oh yeah I have, I have some experience and he's like no no i need to know what real you have do you just pick it up once or twice a year and so listing <laughs> out my accolades and i was like uh um, we could see seven national championships i do this we're doing this so you'll do just fine sir <laughs> <laughs> i was yeah. like oh man but now i'm sitting there like looking at my ammo for this weekend i'm like i'm gonna use up a lot of powder this yep. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, I remember how many rounds I shot did when I went through a pistol cert. It was like, oh, mm-hmm. that was in the middle of, like, the pistol pandemic. And I'm like, oh, no, there goes 100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you start adding it up in your head. <laughs> it's not like, uh, I imagine, when we were both kids, you can just, you know, your parents were, were feeding, the, <laughs> feeding the guns. You didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> I mean, like my Christmas gift every year as a kid was one of those milk cartons of 22s. And uh, <laughs> usually by January, they're all be gone. Yep. <laughs> Might make it to New Year's. <laughs> uh, well, it's, squirrel season was still in during that time. So it, it, usually they were gone. And, and even if I wasn't shooting at the squirrels, I was shooting at something. <laughs> <laughs> I hope someone picks it up just because like, there's a lot of people that work in that plant that right now are freaking out thinking like, what am I going to do for my family? And like, I'm like, if nothing else, I'd love for these guys just to like go, all right, cool. We're, we're going to be shut down for four months, but then we're having a job again or something, you know? Yeah. Just thinking on that side. I mean, not trying to get the humanity aspect in there, but I mean, you know, my profession is so. Yeah. (laughs) You gotta be human. 
for those who don't know, I'm a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> so how's that going for you? I mean, I think the last time we talked, you were just passing, you were going through all your final tests and things, but now you're kind of, this kind of leads in, you know, we're not, we're not just going to talk about Eddie's job. He's, um, he's pretty <laughs> active with a, a you know, firearms related therapy too. Is that right? Yeah. It's in a sense. Yeah. So to give you, to, to tell you, cause then everyone else got to hear it now too. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the, that aspect is going great. Um, the all my licensures are complete now so i have two licenses um and it basically it means i i'm good to do therapy for the head and i also do drug rehab therapy okay so that all that stuff is going good and the other thing he's talking about is i, sh I help out with an organization called walk the talk america which our mission is the intersection of guns and mental health and it'll start up by two gentlemen um jake wiskirchen and michael sabini and mike is a um the former CEO of Eagle Imports. So he was born into it, uh, the gun community. And Jake is a family therapist, which owns his own practice and also has a lot of accolades on his own side. And out in Nevada, he always, and I know what I said that wrong. Uh, Nevada, Nevada, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so the mission with that is a, we do a lot of training and stuff with mental health therapists to understand um gun culture in a sense so that way and also trying to break down the barriers and the the stuff so gun like uh, gun enthusiasts and people who use guns for a living you know like cops security guards and even people who don't like you know paramedics and stuff my background was fire ems so that's where i'm passionate about is mm -hmm. like the people who when you come out and you talk about it because you need help you can be detrimental to your job and that is true in some cases now we're trying to change that culture but it's still there yeah. But the idea of it is that we train actual therapists to be competent in those fields. So they know they can at least find out what gun culture is. They can learn more about these first responder roles. And it is at its heart, it's a suicide like prevention organization mm -hmm. um, because uh, this is the I guess this is the sad part of the podcast again. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, while um, firearms aren't the most popular choice for suicides, they are the most lethal as would one would suspect and uh so that's the idea behind that and that's i mean it's a passion of mine the i kind of found my niche out there in the world i mean i there i'm there's more there's more mental health therapists out there that are pro-gun that have kind of like come out of the closet per se to steal the line from another um community but in but it is definitely a field where you talk about your passion for guns and some people do look at you a little strange at times. Yeah. But I mean, I, I was very open about it when I was going through school. Cause I mean, this is who I am. Like I love guns and I love helping people. And so I, like, kind of just found the niche of might as well just embrace that about myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's really cool. I, I, I think I've said it to you before quite a bit that I think that's a really great, use of of anybody's time and, and and yours especially to kind of find that niche and get in there and, and help some people i think that's really admirable well thank you yeah the and as it's growing um i'll kind of throw it out there for them um if if you ever need if if, if you ever think you're going through a hard time or do you think someone a friend of yours is go to wtta uh, dot org slash love and it's a free and anonymous mental health screening that is done through one of the so sponsoring agencies um which is mental health america and all it does is just ask you some from some questions in it and it doesn't diagnose you but it lets you know like hey you're you're meeting all the science for this would you like to be connected to a gun cultural competent therapist and mm -hmm. if you answer yes it'll put you in touch with someone in your state hmm. i like that term gun culture competent yeah i mean it's the truth i mean as um therapist um my, uh, as therapists and everything, you, we are supposed to be culturally competent to everything. I mean, and uh, well, I'll put it this way: I'm I'm white, and so I don't I don't know what it's like to grow up in an African American house. I don't know what it's like to grow up in LGBTQ com um, community. I know what it's like to grow up in my household, mm -hmm. and so to be understand someone else's to know at least get in a glimpse of someone else's background to be able to better help them. We take cultural competence classes in grad school and everything. So you start to learn other cultures. 
Well, gun culture is a thing too. I mean, just, uh, I mean, <laughs> look on Instagram or look on Facebook one day. Mm-hmm. I mean, and muzzle loading is its own culture too, but I mean, it, we're all encompassing gun culture. So we need to understand what it's like. And we teach people that thing. We, we teach them what gun culture is and it's not this big, scary beast to be scared of. It's, it's normal everyday Americans who just love maybe recreational shooting or love hunting or anything. I mean, the biggest thing that I always like to teach people is that my big thing for therapy is mindfulness. Hmm. And that is the being competent of what you're putting out into the world and being confident that your mind can be applied to those things. And so what I, the same principles that I teach my clients and my patients to apply mindfulness to their everyday practice and their everyday life to overcome any number of problems, you can also apply to shooting a firearm because the same disciplines it takes to have a normal, confident, healthy life is the same discipline it takes to fire that gun and hit the 10X. Hmm. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I do my best trying not to go too much of a rant because I can talk for hours. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> I'm always... <laughs> and I know this isn't the guns and mental health podcast. If you want to listen to them, they do have a podcast. I'll show for them for free. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I'm always looking for some more podcasts to listen to. But yeah. The it's, um, things are going good in that respect. It's, good. um, it's, definitely been growing it's definitely it's opened up a lot of avenues and stuff and it's i've gotten to meet a lot of cool individuals um uh during that during that little journey with them i got to meet there's an organization called liberal gun owners which if you would have told me that five years ago that there's an organization like that i never would have (laughs) believed but it's yeah they're a bunch of they're I may not always see eye to eye with them politically but i can respect them and their belief and their love for guns so like Mm. it's it is kind of cool in that regard um So it's it's a lot of things that I've gotten to meet a lot of cool people along the way doing that. And I'm like, shoot, even you. I mean, granted, this was for my stuff with the NSSA, but I've gotten to meet a lot of cool people along the way that I just – a lot of friendships that I can't turn down. Well, thanks, man. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of great friendships to be able to form. I mean, I think there have always been friendships in the community, but I think as everybody – doesn't like get up to date, but I think as there's more exposure for the community at large of guns mm-hmm. and then even just into black powder and muzzle loading, uh, as more people interact online and new people can absorb the information and start talking the, the terminology and things, I think it just it bolsters a really great community, I think. It's just uh just growing in leaps and bounds right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a slight side note, you got to stop posting pictures of that Kibber mountain rifle, man, because you're making me want to buy um buy the kit. I don't have the money for it right now. <laughs> you you got to save up, man. You got to put those quarters in your piggy bank. Yeah, every single time I see that rifle, I'm sitting there. I just go, I, I have it. I have a little thread saved on my phone that I go and look at it and just like that old picture, <laughs> the old meme of like the guy looking at the Spider-Man picture, just like looking at him. Yeah, just fondly. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a beautiful rifle it's it's so long it's it can be a pain but it's it's just perfect it's exactly what i wanted that kibler is <laughs> it's in the 40 it's cheap to shoot it's dead on i had to take my front sight down a little bit but i'm just is t- can you pink. hunt with 40 can you hunt with 40 in indiana no not yet so okay through the grapevine, I've heard that CVA is is working on that um, to get their new HTR legal because they've got okay. th- they've got like twenty six states now um, where the forty is legal. Um, so okay. I, I don't know if that is I don't I don't know enough about the hunting law history here um, to to say about the the I think our limit is forty five, um, and then for the modern cartridges, there's a bunch of weird sizes <laughs> don't, that, even, don't even get started yeah, on that stuff i don't like, even want let's to. talk about ohio and straight wall cartridges only <laughs> <laughs> i hate ohio <laughs> <laughs> sorry for all my friends in ohio yeah, just, there's a couple <laughs> really good friends i made in ohio but boy you guys got to get out of there run uh, but, a uh, good friend of mine is from ohio so he he says that either like he'll never go back and he hates it and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I wouldn't mind ohio so much if everything I wanted to do was on the other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be going up there later this year up to the Great Lakes site. So I'm going up to the better side of it, but it's okay, still yeah. so far north. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with northern states, but oh, like, why is it so Midwesty? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. 
that one hurts right in my ope. <laughs> I wanted to kind of, I'm going to steer back. We're going to go back a couple of minutes here talking about, um, different people's viewpoints on guns because yeah, sure. I know the, I know several of the folks that I was, uh, demonstrating my flintlock to, uh, weren't necessarily pro gun or anti gun. They just never been around them at all. Um, and I want to posit this theory to you and you let me know what you think, because we're just kind of shooting the breeze here. But I think muzzle loaders and black powder serve as the purpose, the perfect introduction for anybody into firearms and shooting sports in general, because of their simplicity, because of their design and because of the history associated with them. I don't think anybody can look at a muzzle loader, uh, at least a traditional muzzle loader and, and think that it's scary or intimidating. I mean, the, the function of it might be intimidating, I guess, the loading and the cleaning processes. But the firearm itself, I think, is the perfect vehicle to introduce somebody to guns. Yeah, that's. I think you've floated that theory a few times on your podcast. And yeah, I would have to agree. I mean, like a lot of people look at it as like, okay, you start off with 22, then you go to like, um, like a shotgun, and you go to a rifle, or you go to an AR or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I mean... I mean, my wife, I started her out on a muzzleloader, um, and she loved it. <laughs> and the, but like, like the, the actions of it too, is like, can you look at it this way? It's like, why do you give a kid a bolt action 22 first versus an semi-automatic? Because it forces them to slow down and understand the safety aspects. Yep. Well, muzzleloader is perfect for that because every single step, there's, it has to be intentionality behind what you're doing and the safety behind it. And it, if nothing else, it's the intimacy of, Hey, we're doing the powder, right? Here's the ball or here's the, the, the round or the bullet or whatever you're doing. And then you just, you're loading it down and like, all right, now you're capping it or you're putting the primer or whatever you're doing. And, or <laughs> if it's a flintlock, you're, you're, like, you're priming the pan <laughs> <laughs> and then like you're, you know, the shot, I mean, the smoke, the powder, the boom, and then it's back to that again. It's just, yeah. it, there, it slows them down. It gets the process. And I mean, it, let's be honest, they don't kick that hard. No. <laughs> I mean, so you can like, especially with black powder, I mean, you can less lower the charge out till it's barely a mouse fart. <laughs> yeah. And like, I mean, it's just, it's the perfect gun for them because it slows it down. The, I don't think I've ever seen anyone shoot a black powder gun, like especially, at least a traditional, a traditional black powder gun that didn't have a smile on their face. Mm-hmm. They may walk away going, I still don't know about, I don't know if I like guns, but man, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> you have the, you have the little explosions, you have the smoke, the bang. It doesn't, I mean, that was, I think the number one question I received doing that demo was, is it, is it going to kick? Is it going to hurt? You know, and I had, a, I was, there's, it's a 40 caliber and I loaded, you know, just under 40 grains cause they were just shooting at a wood pile, you know, just to shoot. Okay. And uh, I mean, everybody said that doesn't, that didn't hurt at all. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to, you know, <laughs> it yeah. Can, it can just be fun. It's not like we're doing the combat load of 120 grains and buck and ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not trying to take down an elk here. We're not, <laughs> we're a grizzly bear. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, I, I have to agree with that. The, um, I, I don't think a muzzleloader is my first gun I ever shot. It was probably a 22, but it's been so long. But I like, I mean, I do remember the first time I ever did shoot a muzzleloader. And that's just, a, that's just a thought that just, it'll still memory. that will stay with me forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I can't remember if I started on a muzzleloader, if I started on an air rifle, uh, but the first muzzleloader I shot was my grandfather's 54 caliber bench gun. I think it weighed like 12 or 13 pounds. <laughs> and there's a picture of me sitting on a, when Pepsi used to come in that cube um, box, there's a yeah. picture of me sitting yeah. on that, reaching around that big bench. Gun. <laughs> so for me, like, it, it's always been muzzle loaders. Yeah, I've got modern stuff too, but I, I like shooting the muzzle loaders more. I think um, mine was a three band musket. My dad helped me hold it up. Okay, yep. <laughs> if, I, if I'm trying to remember like what he was shooting back then. <laughs> I can I can see a little Eddie there with a propped up musket. <laughs> <laughs> a gun longer than I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how they should be. Guns should be long. <laughs> All right, Mr. Flintlock. <laughs> uh, if the ramrod's not as tall as I am, I'm not shooting it. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's uh, you, you got to get off this, man. I'm gonna have to. My, my wife's gonna see a charge on the credit card, and I, you're never gonna hear from me. Oh, again. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, the best thing about it 
Yes. <laughs> that she wants one too. So yeah, maybe yeah, I can go. go to that way. <laughs> Here, this is how you pitch it. And for any of the young men out there with, with their wives or their girlfriends that you're really serious about, you know, call it a joint gift. You know, it's for both of us. We'll put it together well, together. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll spend the day building well, it. We'll go out to dinner. We'll come back. We'll work on it some more. We'll go on well, a that couple... was the idea behind that flintlock pistol. It's <laughs> there, a joint gift. There you go. <laughs> And uh, you can say with confidence that it has upped the quality of your marriage, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't. I don't know if I like the idea of giving her more firearms. No, I'm just messing. <laughs> She's a lovely wife. <laughs> uh, I'm. I'm very blessed as well. Uh, my wife is very, very gung ho about it and very supportive. I've got to. I've got to get her behind a few here soon, though. She's itching to itching to shoot some more you need to bring her on one day as like the uh, all females perspective and uh, like the shooting world i mean because the i know there's um we have a couple uh, a number of ladies that shoot in the organization mm -hmm. um, but if you look at it for so long it's always been a good old boys club and yeah women are one of the fastest growing demographics in like the shooting world and and like some pieces just like they like to jump aboard that and do talking points but let's just get beyond that and just like Hey, that's awesome that more people are enjoying shooting and and not even just shooting in general, but there's like um if I go into like um different stores and stuff like right before muzzle loading season, you can see people from all different creeds and walks of life looking at buying the firearm and for like and like who cares if it's just a modern inline or if or if it's or if it's like the cheap Walmart special. At the end of the day, they're buying something that's like it's gonna put that little spark in them that's gonna get them behind like just enjoying the culture, enjoying the firearm. And if it goes bang and they enjoy it, who cares what they're shooting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're out there, you know, exercising the good old second amendment there and having fun in a, in a safe manner, it's, you can't argue with that. I don't think. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that we need to rip a bandaid off or talk about? I mean, it's I don't know. been a good chat. I mean, yeah, this I, has thank been you great. for having me on. <laughs> yeah, dude. Anytime. I think it'd be really great to, to do a few of these if you're, if you're ever game for yeah. it. Yeah. Just kind of let a casual, me, you know, catching up and yeah. seeing what's going on. Let me um plug the NSSA one more time. Yeah, yeah. Mind. Go ahead and do your do your plugs so, and. Yeah. So, um, for anyone who's interested in learning more about the North South Skirm Association, you can go to um, uh, nssa.org. And if you want to look at the magazine, I do um, host the magazine online for free on the website, and you can go down there and take a look. And if you're old school and you want to do like an actual printed copy, I do do print it. I, I, we do offer printed copies um, for non-members. Uh, Just email me and I'll get you in touch with everything. And my email is very simple. It's nssaeditor at gmail.com. And if anyone who's interested in like submitting any type of history articles or shooting articles or anything, um, hit me up. I'll gladly feature you and stuff like that. We can work around. Like um, if you talk to me, we can kind of talk in the background of what that means and what you get from it and everything. And if anyone's ever interested in coming out to a shoot, uh, our main nationals are at Winchester, Virginia. But we also there's there's shoots all across basically it, it, the the Civil War states, you know, from Texas to New York and all across the Midwest and everything and all the South. And so there's teams everywhere. There's shoots that happen all the time. And like I said, if you're there's something for everyone. I mean, if you enjoy that Civil War aspect shooting, there's that there's artillery matches. If that's not your thing, but you really love like the dress, the clothing aspect of that stuff, we have uh, we have the dress committee where they do actual dress competitions and then like the um, and not like dress in like that, like a flowy dress, which is part of the competition. Well, I'm talking about clothing competitions in general. And so like the, there's the people that do that style stuff and there's, I mean, there's everything. And it's just, it's just a good family atmosphere. There's, it's like, if you're a family person, it's a safe place for your kids. It's a cool place to hang out. If you don't have kids like us and just want to come out and hang out with people, I mean, it's, it's a great organization to be a part of. And it's something that's, I was raised in and I'm very proud to say I'm now like I work for. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great story. I think that if you're out there and you're not spending your twenties and thirties shooting black powder, you really need to re rethink what you're doing with your life. And yeah, rethink your priorities, man. Yeah. What, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this episode uh, is <laughs> rethinking your priorities with Eddie Davenport. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm gonna hear from that one. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> oh man, this has been great. If um, I'll gladly come back on and do stuff. I, yeah, man, <sighs> this is great. <laughs> I love these chill episodes, guys. The um, for everyone who's listening. Uh, thanks for letting me, me and Ethan just kind of ramble on. If you're still listening at this point, God bless you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Get in touch with Eddie. He's going to send you some money for listening because this has been... Yeah, by way of Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to pull you back in here, but I think it's really neat that they have a... The NSSA has a dress committee. I think that... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the neat thing about muzzleloaders that... I mean, all the modern guys, they have all their gear and, and their clothes that they, they play dress up in, you know, but I think when it comes to, when it comes to dressing and, and, you know, the historic accuracy of the clothing and things, I think muzzleloading has the coolest. Um, yeah. I mean, coolest it, clothes. one thing I guess, the one thing I guess I did add about the NSSA is that it almost is like a reenactment light for the people who don't know what we are. Cause each team is based off a historical unit. Um, historical and quotation marks because there's a couple teams that didn't like are based on things that didn't actually exist they're mm. just cool theories but like i'll throw mine out there were I'm, i shoot with the dismal swamp rangers which is company a <laughs> third for Genesia, dismal swamp ranger i love that and, name yeah <laughs> we are the swamp rats <laughs> <laughs> But like, so like we wear the actual uniforms that the, they wore in that time, like uh, wool pants, shirts and everything. And then uh, my carbine uniform, I have it, um, it's red shirts and gray um, and tan pants. And there's a story out there of who we're supposed to represent, but it's been so far removed. But like each team is based off of an historical unit, which like one of our models is we keep history alive through like, like, like through firing guns, stuff like that, which is so true. Mm -hmm. And the dress committee, man, these I've talked, I've, I've gotten to talk to some of them and I've printed some of their articles they've given me and man, their stuff is intense. Not only is it like really pretty cool, like some of the dresses are just really cool looking, but like the actual clothing aspect for the men, like the gentlemen wear, Oh man, some days I think I was born in the wrong century. <laughs> <laughs> you get some of that high class clothing going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got a, um, I ordered a, uh, late 18th century hunting coat um that's coming in from from <laughs> cob creek merchants it's supposed to be here either tomorrow or wednesday and uh i drive home pretty giddy to see if it's uh if it's <laughs> if it's come i knew it wasn't going to come today but i was excited anyway <laughs> you'll have to wear it with your double pouch possibility bag there we just... go <laughs> <laughs> There's an inside joke there that he texted me the day he got it, which I know none of you get. But if you go look up the possibility bag, you'll probably immediately catch the joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'd like to thank Eddie again for coming onto the show. It was really great to just kind of relax and uh, and talk to a black powder buddy. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's a little different. Um, if you didn't, next time we have Eddie on, we'll try to have some more outline topics so it kind of lines up with some of the other episodes that we do. But sometimes it's nice just to unwind a little bit and and, uh, and talk muzzleloading and black powder with a good friend. I'll have a link to everything that Eddie discussed in this episode in the show notes and on the blog post that goes with this episode at ilovemuzzleloading.com. It'll make it easy for you to check out any of the stuff that Eddie has been talking about, and you can uh, easily find his email address there. Tap it and, uh, and send him an email and ask him any questions that you might have about what he He's talked about here on the episode. If you haven't heard, we're still continuing our I Love Muzzleloading hunting giveaway. Uh, each month we pick a winner in a traditional, modern, and youth muzzleloader hunting class. All you have to do is tag us or send us a picture of you with your muzzleloader and uh, and you out on a hunt with a trophy or without. It doesn't matter if you've uh, if you've taken game yet or not. Um, and uh, we'll feature on the website. And uh, and at the end of the month, uh, we'll go through and pick a few winners to send them a free ilovemuzzleloading.com hat. We have a lot of colors to pick from. And uh, if we select you and your picture, you get to pick the color of hat that you want and we'll send it to you free of charge. Along with that, if you have a great story that goes along with your picture, I'd love to talk to you on the podcast. You can reach out to us at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com. I do my best to reply uh, really within the week, and uh, odds are it's going to be within a couple of days uh, of every email message that I get. So uh, really excited to talk to you about muzzleloading and muzzleloader hunting, and uh, really just want to get some free hats out there and uh, help further promote uh, the tradition of muzzleloader hunting here in the United States. 
I'd like to again thank everybody for listening. I Love Muzzleloading is a passion project for us here. It's a, it's really a labor of love, and I can't thank everybody enough who's continued to listen and everybody who has, has commented and sent in some feedback, who has rated the podcast, and uh, who and those of you that continue to share what we're putting out here, I, I really appreciate it. Um, the, the reception that we've received from the muzzleloading community this year has just been incredible. And uh, I hope to continue what we've started to do here this year uh, for many years to come to further promote muzzleloading and, uh, and the people that have kept it going um, through all these generations. Um, I think, like we talk about a lot on the show, muzzleloading didn't stop when cartridge or repeating arms or smokeless powder was invented. It continued to be here. It continued to evolve and change. And we have a lot of people um, that have made that happen. And I, I've really enjoyed sharing with you a little slice of that every few weeks here with the podcast. If you want to help out the show, uh, you can do a couple things uh, that are really free of charge. Uh, there's no money involved. <laughs> you can uh, you can rate us on your podcast platform of choice. Leave us a review. That helps us reach more muzzleloading enthusiasts in the algorithm. You can share what we're doing on social media um, if you're so inclined, or, or you can just you know send it directly to a friend that you think might be interested in, in muzzleloading or black powder. All these things help us reach more people that might be interested in muzzleloading, help us move up in the algorithms and things of, of all the platforms and how they work. And, uh, and it, uh, it really helps us out here. And, uh, you know, I really can't thank you enough, everybody that's left a review. I'd also like to thank uh, my wife Paisley for her continued support of what we're doing here. It's, uh, it's really nice to have a, a partner in life like Paisley, like my wife here, that, uh, that cares about muzzleloading and is excited about it, even though she didn't necessarily grow up with firearms or muzzleloaders at all. Um, she's really keen and, and really supportive on seeing this continue uh, for our kids and, and our grandkids and our great grandkids someday. And uh, I can't thank her enough for her support. So I just wanted to wanted to thank her again here at the end of the episode. That's all I have for you this week. Um, thank you again. And uh, we'll catch you next time.